So that no one misunderstands this presentation, it is a recruiting presentation. I am the lead recorder for the Ripley Hawk Watch, which has been recognized by the Hawk Migration Association of North America as one of the four outstanding hawk watches on the Eastern Great Lakes for the spring migration. I am also involved in trying to get more eyes to join us. We have also been recognized and will be in a world encyclopedia of hawk watch sites as sponsored by the Hawk Mountain Association in Kempton, Pennsylvania. We need eyes. Not only do we need eyes, we need people that want to enjoy a period of time. Hawking in Chautauqua County is a year-round process. There are two peak periods to do hawking. The most important one for Chautauqua County is in the spring of the year. And the majority of birds, I shouldn't say the majority of birds, the highest number of birds can be seen in the last two weeks of April. However, if you want to see the red-shouldered hawk in migration, uh, you have to be willing to uh, come out in March. They're, they're, for all practical purposes, are gone. The red-tailed hawk, which is resident here year-round, along with the red-shouldered hawk, um, has most of its migration also in March. So it depends upon what you're interested in seeing. We have had the privilege of logging through 18 species of birds of prey in the Ripley picket line operation. However, I don't want to spend all the time dealing with the question of the Ripley picket line, although that's what I'm recruiting for. Uh, I want you to understand that you can go hawking this afternoon if you want to. We have in residence in Chautauqua County this time of year the American kestrel, which is the smallest of all of the birds of prey that uh, we have flying uh, through Chautauqua County or in Chautauqua County. And this is, this is what your American kestrel looks like. Uh, it has a 22-inch wingspan. It's, it's a bird of, of small dimension. It's a mouse eater. It's a fellow bird eater. Uh, he'll come in and or she will come in and visit your uh, bird feeding system if you have one. That's the smallest bird that you can see this time of year in Chautauqua County. If you're very fortunate, you also can have the experience of the eagle. We now have, on a year-round basis, we now have the bald eagle flying in Chautauqua County. It's an immense bird. We're talking about something with a six-foot wingspan. Uh, they hacked 14 young eagles in Erie and Warren County, Pennsylvania this, this season from various nests. And they are up and eating in this area. Realize that the eagle in and of itself is a scavenger, uh, but we, we love it. It's, it's majestic. Another bird that you might see down on the lake plain is the bird at the, at the bottom of the uh, illustration, which is the northern harrier or marsh hawk. Uh, notice that the female is, is an orange and brown bird and that the male is a silver gray bird. Uh, this bird is basically an open field bird and he's, they basically fly very low to the ground. They have an owl type face. So you have the opportunity to see that bird this time of year. Also this time of year, you have the rare privilege of, of trying to identify the difference between a sharp shin hawk, a cooper's hawk, and the northern goshawk. The real problem is to be able to get the bird to give you enough of a display so that you can tell which bird you're dealing with. The sharp shin hawk and the cooper's hawk overlap in size, and if you have a female sharp shin hawk, and a male cooper's hawk, you almost have to have them in hand to tell which is which. Another bird that we will see this time of year uh, is the red-shouldered hawk. Along with the red-shouldered hawk, of course, is the red-tailed hawk that is here <clears throat> all year round. All of these birds may be seen, if you have the patience, to do your hawking in the winter in Chautauqua County. 
But if you really want to have fun, this is where I'm recruiting. <clears throat> the Ripley picket line is made up of five volunteers and then other people that come out at different times. The average age is above 65. We need some younger eyes. Uh, how can I induce you to come out? Well, let me tell you about the Ripley picket line. Let's, let's switch over to the easel and, and look at what the Ripley picket line looks like. <clears throat> this is our illustration handout. And you'll see number one is on the Foresight Road Bridge over the New York State Thruway. And that's where we start every day at 9 o'clock when we are on a full daily watches. Depending upon wind conditions, we may move to Station 2, which is a landing field for a vineyard, and uh, we have permission to be off the highway. The, uh, this is when we have wonderful south winds, and these south winds are overpowering the lake winds. Station number three, four, and five are when we get westerly winds and northwesterly winds. We start every morning at nine o'clock at station one. If you are interested, uh, call me at 753-7451 and I'll gladly send you a copy of the map or tell you where you can pick it up. This year, we are doing something different. For the last five years, we have recorded <clears throat> the flight of birds along the Lake Erie shore. This year, we are going to attempt to identify how Lake Erie affects the migration, which is an entirely different question than the birds flying along the Lake Erie shore. We found last year, prior to April 19th, that we had 17 days when the regional weather had a wind, a gentle wind out of the south and southwest. But on the Ripley picket line, we had an onshore breeze from the expanding air from over Lake Erie. And we found up at Belson's, uh, <clears throat> up uh, at Pigeon Road, which is four and a half miles inland, that where the cold air and the warm air met, and the warm air came against the cold air and then rose, that the birds were flying along that particular piece of weather system. And so this year we are going to try and be more mobile. And when we have realized that I can sit down at station one and see one bird all day long, but if I'm up where the weather break is taking place, we might see two or 300 birds in a particular day. We don't know what it's going to do to our overall numbers. Uh, but let me give you an idea of what happens. On the 15th of February this year, we will begin the watch for the 1996 season. I will go out on days that I deem the weather systems to be attractive to the migration of particularly the red-tailed hawk because they are uh, the earliest of the migrants that we've been able to define. Uh, and when those weather systems are correct, uh, I'm off to the station one. And that will go on from February 15th to March 15th. We will come out on those particular days. What are those particular days? Very simple. If you look at your weather map on whatever your weather channel is, and there is a low passing over the Great Lakes or uh, above the Great Lakes, realize that the winds of a low move counterclockwise. Therefore, on the easterly side of the low, we have winds coming up from the south. And that's when that phenomenon takes place, and as that low passes by and the front hanging down from it passes by, the birds are encouraged to use the energies within that weather system as part of their migration. Let me give you an idea of migration and the importance of winds and thermals for the birds migrating. If a bird is sitting, doing nothing but snoozing, we'll call that one unit of energy. If a bird is in flight, in flap flight, depending upon the size of the bird, because we're talking about birds that, that weigh seven or eight ounces up to 13 pounds when we talk about the range of the birds that we can see. If it's in flap flight, it's using 13 to 15 times the energy that it would use just sitting on a perch. 
If it is soaring and using the thermals of the weather system as part of its migration, it's using one and a half to three times its normal sitting energy. So you can see that it is to a great advantage of the bird to use thermal systems and weather systems as part of their migration. Realize that some of these birds are going to fly 4,000 miles in one direction, coming back up from the Amazon jungle, or in the case of the osprey, coming up from as far away as Argentina. Uh, they're going to have to use those weather systems in order to survive. Anyway, from February 15th to March 15th, we go out on what we deem to be good weather days. Starting March 15th, we're out every day. We start the day at 9 o'clock in the morning, unless the day before was extremely warm and the weather system is just right. We may then come out as early as 7 o'clock in the morning. But our starting time nominally is 9. How long do we stay out? Well, those of us that have got the bug stay out until the flight goes down. And how do we know when the flight goes down? Uh, it's something we've learned over 10 years. We also are, have from the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute the loan of two handheld radios that we use to communicate to one another when we are on different stations. And we can scan the weather system stations. And we know when the weather has gone bad in Pittsburgh and when the weather has gone bad in Erie. And these birds do not fly in rain or snow. They, however, will fly in winds up to 50 miles an hour. They will fly in between rain and snow clouds. And uh, it's amazing. You have to join us to understand what type of weather these birds will tolerate or capitalize on. If you want to see red-shouldered hawks, you've got to join us before the 1st of April. There will be one or two red shoulders tucked in later on through the season, but the vast majority of the red-shouldered hawks have gone. And of course, as we get into uh, March, we begin to look for the first of the turkey vultures coming north. Uh, when you get a single turkey vulture, you say spring is here. Remember that Hinckley, Ohio has its turkey vultures celebration, I believe, on the uh, 15th or 17th of March, uh, when the birds supposedly return. Then the next bird we are looking for is the osprey. Now realize that we have a number of birds that have been resident in the county all winter. But these birds are not necessarily really truly residents. There's a whole series of birds that only partially migrate. The great migrators are the turkey vulture, the broad-winged hawk, and the osprey. These are the birds that fly the greatest distances. Uh, the red-tailed hawk may not leave the continental United States. The sharp shin hawk and the uh, Cooper's hawk will not leave the continental United States. Then we have some birds that move east and west, and we have a bird that comes south and spends the winter with us, the rough-legged hawk, uh, an enormously large bird. He's bigger than the red-tailed hawk, or she is. I don't know why I keep adding gender uh, to the bird, but it is of interest that the birds, as they migrate, do not migrate in pairs. They do not migrate like waterfowl, where you have you can spot a whole family. I can remember when I used to hunt ducks. One day, a, a family of blue-winged teal came in and sat right down in front of my blind. It was, it was what caused me to give up duck hunting, to be frank about it, because I could have had them in the pot, and there was just no way I was going to shoot the birds. Uh, but they migrate as a family. The birds of prey migrate as individuals, but the reason that you see large numbers of them is because they gather and take advantage of the weather systems. A thermal, uh, in a fall migration, you may see several thousand birds just churning around as they're heading south. And of course, the fall migration has a larger population because you have all of the progeny of that, that particular summer. The other unique thing is that in most instances, Young birds do not migrate with older birds. Fact is, when the family breaks up in the fall, the young birds that are going to migrate, migrate first. They migrate totally on instinct, to the best of our knowledge at this point. Uh, and then in the following weeks, the, the adults begin to come. In the spring of the year, particularly the red-tailed hawks, it's evident, 
you begin to understand and identify a, a bird far off by its gestalt, its overall design and the way it's flying. Because each bird has its own very distinctive characteristics. Uh, the red-tailed hawks, the adults, you basically see them in migration first, in the spring migration. They're coming up to nest, and they're frantically on their way to nest. How frantic? Well, it sometimes takes two minutes to watch a bird go from horizon to horizon, depending upon the, the weather system that you're dealing with. As conversely, we have a, a little interesting migration that takes place in August when all of the immature red-tailed birds move northeasterly along the south shore of Lake Erie. And it's something, if you remember Dumbo, the elephant that flew, well, you're looking at these young red-tailed hawks. Oh, I can do a wing over. Oh, look at I can hover. And it's, it's just amusing to watch them. But that only goes on for a short period of time in the fall for us. If you want a fall migration, you have to go to the north side of the lakes. The spring migration, the Ripley picket line, is intensively involved from February 15th to June 15th. From March 15th to May 15th, we're out every day. We only leave when we know the flight has gone down, or we believe the flight has gone down, or the weather system is so bad. The birds do not like to fly in snow, rain, sleet. They'll fly in fog. Uh, they do not necessarily, as the season gets older and older, there's no use coming out on a day where there's an easterly wind. However, in the peak weeks of April, the birds are so intent on getting up and starting their nesting that they'll take a day of east wind sometimes. In fact, the last year, one of our high count days was a peculiar east wind uh, related off of the lake uh, and the warm air coming up from the south. And, and they met right over Route 5 for a whole day, and we had some 600 birds. The other thing is that we need more eyes for is, is we make mistakes. We don't see a bird. We're caught off. Somebody hollers, strange bird, which is the code for drop everything and look at I've got something that I can't identify. Uh, one day, my wife and I and Leonard D. Francisco were down on Route 5 with a very strong wind. And I had said, I've just counted 600 birds in that kettle. And Leonard says, no, there's 700 birds. And my wife, standing behind the two of us, says, you're each counting different kettles of birds. So that type of thing can happen. That particular day, which was the 20th of April in 92, uh, we had 2,500 birds in an hour. And we, after the hour was over, we were literally exhausted. But you couldn't, you couldn't ask for a, uh, a more exuberant time. The number of birds that you might be involved with, better than half of our days, we see fewer than 10 birds. So what you've got to do is learn to look at the weather map and see if we're going to have southwesterly winds. Days of southwesterly winds and northwesterly winds are the days that give us the biggest counts in the last two weeks of April. Uh, sometimes we spend only a moment on the throughway bridge over Foresight Road and immediately move off. The other thing that is important is that you, if you want to join us, be prepared for the weather. A four and a half mile an hour wind at 32 degrees will cool you off unless you are properly dressed. Uh, we dress in underwear, then winter underwear over that, and then some type of a cover, and then another cover, and we just layer and layer and layer ourselves. Uh, we also feel that you ought to have a hood type of sweatshirt because we also recommend that you have a visor type cap. And when you have a hood, you can tie that cap down so that when the breeze and it sometimes gets to 50 and 60 miles an hour and birds are in the air, uh, you can keep your hat on. Uh, without being prepared, you're good at best for a half hour. And it's not going to be a happy half hour, because it might be the half hour that we didn't see any birds. And we've, on a number of occasions, we've had people come out and spend two hours with us and say, well, there's nothing flying, so I'm going home. And the next hour, it's gangbusters. Several years ago, Doc Scholl, the dentist over in Westfield, uh, 
had been saying he wanted to come out, he wanted to come out. My, my wife had an appointment with him, and I said, you tell the doc that the weather system is absolutely ideal. Tell him to get his buns out here today. He closed his office, brought his whole staff out. I had enough binoculars so that all of his staff could have binoculars. And the hour they spent with us, they saw 442 birds, eight species. Uh, very, very fortunate experience. That doesn't happen that often. But uh, it's something. Now somebody is going to ask, why are you involved in spending this much energy in looking at birds of prey? Birds of prey are the top of the food web. When there is something wrong in the food web, one of the first places it shows up is in the birds of prey. And one of the things that happened was that we began to lose the American bald eagle, we began to lose the osprey, we began to lose the peregrine falcon. And what we found out was that these birds were reacting to DDT that was in the environment. And their shells were getting thinner and thinner, and they were not able to raise broods. Along with other evidence, uh, we no longer use DDT in the United States. I'm sorry to say we still manufacture it and ship it to many places throughout the world, but without DDT they would not be able to keep up the food crops that they have, and so they are still using them. Uh, DDT has disappeared from England, Canada, the United States. And what has happened? We now have bald eagles in Chautauqua County year-round. I'll guarantee you, if you are attentive, uh, you, in the, particularly early in the year before nesting patterns have been set up, you'll see several osprey over Chautauqua Lake. The peregrine falcon has come back. I've, we have had the audacity to report five peregrine falcons in one day, which is an outstanding number. Uh, the merlin has come back also. Uh, and that's th those are the exciting days when somebody that's in the watch group hollers, strange bird, and we all look at it. And, Nominally, it's a peregrine or a merlin or in a couple of cases, uh, a Mississippi kite. Uh, and in several, almost every year now, we are seeing at least one Swainson's hawk. Now, this bird is not supposed to fly east of the Mississippi, but there is a particular set of weather patterns that when they uh, pass across the United States, I tell the gang, in the next two days, we have an opportunity to see sandhill cranes and possibly a Swainson's hawk. Uh, we see an awful lot of other birds. Don't get me wrong, we don't just sit there and, and look at hawks. Uh, we watch for the uh, tent caterpillar nests to begin to change and start to grow, and then we begin watching for the yellow-billed cuckoo. Uh, we also begin to listen for the warblers in the trees. Uh, long about the time the uh, Oak leaves are about the size of a mouse's ear. We begin to look for the scarlet tanager. We begin to look for the rose-breasted grosbeak, the orioles, uh, the indigo buntings, and all of those wonderful birds that you nominally don't see, but during the migration you get to see them in, in goodly numbers. We also count crow migrations. Uh, it's not unusual if, if the year is right to see a couple of thousand blue jays in a day migrating north, and yet you think of a blue jay being here all year round, but they're partial migrants. And one day we counted an estimated 6,500 Canada geese. But the interesting thing was that day they weren't flying north. They were flying southwest along the shore of, of Lake Erie. Uh, had to be a frontal system or something just out over the edge of the lake that was causing them to fly in that particular direction. Uh, great blue herons, we've seen as many as 15 or 20 of those a day in the spring migration. Uh, green herons, shorebirds that I don't identify but other members of the crew can. And it's a wonderful, wonderful period of time. And I need eyes. I need people that want to come out and aren't afraid to look up and say, that's a rah rah, and we know what it isn't, and we tell them why it isn't a rah rah, that it's something else, uh, and get them to, to join us. We've, we've had a larger crew, but uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, Father Time has taken some of our crew members from us. The picket line was established by Fran, and Lo Fran Rue and Lois Buck in 1984. 
they came out on what they called good weather days. And we came out, we, I went out one time in 1985 because a friend of mine had said, hey, if you want to see birds of prey, you've got to catch the spring migration. Well, I met Lois and Fran. Uh, these two ladies at that point had 90 years of birding between them. Uh, Lois Buck had been president of Jamestown Audubon at one, at one point in her life. Uh, we then began to come out and spend more and more time when I could. And then finally, when I retired in 1990, I kind of pledged to Lois and Fran that I'd do a couple of years of full migration season every day of the, of the peak migration so that we could really see uh, what the samples were that we took and how they related to the, the full migration. Well, we've been at it now for 10 years, 11 years. And we've come to the conclusion that we're really not counting the migration, we're counting the birds that fly along the shore of Lake Erie. So this coming year, we're going to attempt to identify how Lake Erie affects the uh, bird of prey migration in the uh, spring of the year. The number of people that are needed, hey, the more people that would come and join us, realize that the pay is tremendous. It's companionship, it's fellowship, it's the joy of seeing the birds. It, that's it, no more, no less. Uh, we report to the Hawk Migration Association of North America. We are published annually. Uh, we have now become part of an international hawk or bird of prey network that is censusing the birds to try and understand what is happening, to try and understand the bird themselves as individuals, and also to keep a check on the top of the food web. When the food web is in trouble, it'll be reflected in the birds of prey very early on. And maybe we can correct it before it becomes a disaster. Dedication? I don't know if that's what you want to call it. It's craziness. It's, there's, there's, there's no other way to describe it. Uh, Leonard D. Francisco, Harley Northrup, Charles Hanks, Nancy Lunsman, Gil and Jan Randall, John Lunsman, and then we get help from Tom Simmons, other people from the Lake Erie Bird Club, people from Jamestown Audubon. But we could use you. I could use your eyes. If you don't have binoculars, come on out. We have binoculars that we can share with you until you decide whether or not you want to buy binoculars. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a spotting scope, bring it. But we only use a spotting scope when a bird is sitting down. Uh, the birds, in most instances, are moving just too fast to use a spotting scope. But every once in a while, we get a kestrel or a merlin that will sit in one of the uh, local trees and we'll be able to, to watch it with a spotting scope. Or in some instances when the birds are flying far enough away that their speed is not of great importance, Lenny DeFrancisco will take his, his crutch-mounted scope and identify the bird for us. Uh, we also re record the migration in, in some instances. Leonard and I have created a 38-minute uh, education VHS tape uh, for people that are interested. We would gladly share that with people uh, that would want to join us. We, we could loan it to you. And you can sit at home and, and look at 38 minutes of uh, 12 species of birds in flight so you could get a sense of the type of identification you needed. Uh, the rest of the tape, there's, there's several minutes on how to dress because we're, we're, I can't be more emphatic about anything that I've said this after, or this, the, today. If you're going to enjoy it, dress for it. Layer, 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 layer. Uh, also, a good set of insulated boots, uh, even if they weigh five pounds or ten pounds apiece. Uh, you need them in order to enjoy it. So come join the Ripley Picket Line. Uh, you can get us by telephone, 753-7451, uh, which is my phone in Mayville. Uh, Leonard D. Francisco can be contacted through 665 4999 in Jamestown. Uh, we'll be just tickle pink to have you join us. It's until you have had an experience of a peak day, you don't have the sickness. Once you've had the privilege of seeing thousands of birds in one day and seeing maybe as many as 13 different species, you're hooked. And we need some more people out here. We need to be able to finish the work of trying to identify how the Lake Erie weather system affects the hawk migration as it heads northward in the spring of the year.